Let the church say amen again. I am very thankful for that song and I'm thankful for the singers who sang it. Let me go ahead and say happy Sabbath to everyone. I have a question for you. Are you really happy? Amen. I don't want you to ever get used to just saying things that you don't mean. The world already does that enough. But the people of God, we should be sincere in our sentiments. And there is, even though we're living in a dark cloud of time in Earth's history, there are still rays of sunshine that God is shining through, that the people of God should still be joyful individuals. And so it is my hope and my prayers that indeed it is a happy Sabbath. I am very grateful for the opportunity to talk with us a little bit. The title of our message is a very important one. It's a very solemn one to think about. The title of our study this morning, and it is going to be a study. We're going to go through our Bibles. There's no screen this morning. And uh, when we go through this study, we're going to consider this question. What do you do when your gifts are flourishing, but your fruit is rotting? I want you to think about that with me. What do you do or what should we do when our gifts are flourishing, but our fruit is rotting? Let us all prepare our hearts for this study as we go to our knees, if you're able to. If you can't kneel, just bow your heads where you are. But if you can kneel, let's kneel together and let's ask the Lord to prepare our hearts to receive the word. Our loving Father, we are very grateful for this privilege and opportunity for us to press together and to study together. And Lord, we're grateful for this wonderful Sabbath morning. Our hearts have already been so filled, but there's still more about Jesus we would learn. And so I pray even now that you will grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit and that we might be convicted first and foremost for our sins, that we may confess them before you and acknowledge them and by your grace forsake them and even overcome them. But Lord, we pray that you will enlighten our minds and help us to understand what we read. And may you speak directly to our heart need individually. And may you help us to climb just a little bit higher on Jacob's ladder, ultimately to arrive in the arms of Jesus. This is our prayer that we do ask in his worthy and mighty matchless. Amen. You know, in the. In the type, whenever you think about a type. I want you to think about that sun that's shining right now. If you don't understand typology, types and anti types in a type, a type produces a shadow. Every time you stand in sunlight, it, it produces a type on the ground. We call it a shadow. And that shadow is a reflection of a reality. Is that right? So whenever I think of a type, I think of a shadow. When I think of an anti-type, I think of a reality. Something that God is really trying to point us to. And we are living in the anti-typical day of atonement. It's a time of judgment. John the Revelator made it very, very clear when he said that a messenger was to go throughout all the world. And it was going to let every nation, kindred, tongue, and people Understand that we are living in a time that we need to fear God and give glory to him because the hour of his judgment is come. That's Revelation 14 and verse 7. For those who have never read that, you want to read it. The Bible declares that a judgment takes place before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Last night, we looked at Revelation 14, 14 and 15. We saw that the harvest time represents the end of the world. That's Christ's coming. But before the harvest time, there's a judgment that has come. It's already here. And it makes sense because Jesus made a statement in Revelation 22 where he said, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. You only give a reward to people who have passed judgment. They must have gone through a scrutinization of some sort and have been found worthy of their reward. Now, understanding this. The Bible gave three instructions for the people of God during the time of judgment. Go to Luke, uh, Leviticus 23. I want you to watch this. In Leviticus 23, we are doing Bible study. After all, it is Sabbath school. Amen. And I want you to see in Leviticus 23, the Bible gave instruction on what exactly God's people should be doing during the time of judgment. The Bible says in Luke, Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, if you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says in Leviticus 23, we're going to look at verse 27. 
It says in Leviticus 23 and verse 27, it says, also on the 10th day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of what? Atonement. You know, I, I one time I was asking my students, we, we, I, have a, I have a young adult group that I work with in California. That's where I'm stationed right now in Northern California. And I have a young adult group. We have approximately 40 to 50 young adults between the ages of 20 and 40 that are absolutely starving and hungering for more of God's present truth. Amen. And God has given me this group that I can go ahead and teach and guide and instruct. And we were going over in class. We, I'm, I'm teaching them how to study the Bible, how to have prayer and communion. We're going through a lot. And I remember we got to this point in the class where I began to ask them questions. And I said, listen, when you study the Bible, when you look to the word of God, there are things that God wants you to see from the word, directly from the word. Now, we're talking about this day of atonement. Now, I said, is the day of atonement a day of judgment? That's what I asked them. And you know what they said? Uh, yes. I said, prove it. Prove it right from the Bible. No Ellen White allowed. Prove it right from the Bible. Because when you quote Ellen White to a whole bunch of Baptists and Methodists, they're going to say, Ellen who? <laughs> they're going to be like, oh, I got an auntie named Ellen. You, you talking about my auntie? They don't know Ellen White. And some of us, we have become masters at regurgitating what Ellen White says and we're dwarfs and knowing what the Bible says. That is not God's will. That is not God's will. And most people who know more Ellen White than the Bible are typically fanatics. They usually go in a fanatical route sooner or later. And so you want to be very careful, beloved. So I asked them, I said, how can you prove that the day of atonement is a day of judgment straight from the Bible? And the answer was, we can't. We don't know. We can't. We know we heard it. We know it's been taught largely in Adventism, but we don't, in fact, know. And I said, well, it's very simple. There are two things that the Bible says will take place on the Day of Atonement. Two things. Now you're in Leviticus 23. I pause here. I want to go to Leviticus 16. Keep your finger on Leviticus 23, though. Go to Leviticus 16. How can I prove that the day of atonement is in fact, biblically, a day of judgment. How can I prove that? How can I help somebody see that? The Bible says it right here in Leviticus 16. Now you're in Leviticus, the 16th chapter. When you get there, just say amen. amen. Beautiful. Happen. Look at what it says in Leviticus 16, right there in verse 30. In Leviticus 16 and verse 30, notice what the Bible says. It says, for on that day, this is speaking about the day of atonement. It says, for on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to do something. To do what? Cleanse. To cleanse you that you may be clean from how much? From all your sins. So we know for sure thus far that the day of atonement is a day where God's desire is to cleanse his people from all their sins. Would we agree with that? Is that straight from the text? Now I'll go to Leviticus 23. Now, if you look at Leviticus 23, we were just reading Leviticus 23 and we stopped at verse 27. Now, I want you to watch it again. In Leviticus 23 and verse 27, the Bible says also on the 10th day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you and you shall do something. What do you got to do? You got to afflict your soul, afflict your souls, offer an offering made by fire and you shall do no work. That's your threefold work. That was the threefold work on the day of atonement. The people had to afflict their souls. They had to offer an offering made by fire and they had to do no work. You need to understand what that means. Not in the type only. You must understand what that means in the what? Anti-type. What does that mean today? But let's continue. It continues by saying in verse 28, and you shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be what? Aha. Uh -huh. So notice, on the day of atonement, if the people were not doing that which was representing cooperation with God, the Bible says that they could be what? I want to know what cut off means. So let's continue. It says they shall be cut off. Now watch this. Verse 28 again, and you shall do no work in that same day, for it's a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. Verse 29, for whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. What do you mean, Lord? Verse 30, and whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I do what? 
destroyed from among his people. To be cut off is to ultimately be what? Destroyed. So you know what helped me see that the day of atonement is a day of judgment. The way that I see that is because it's a day that only one of two things happens. We either are cleansed or cut off. How does God determine who gets cleansed? How does God determine who gets cut off? He has to perform an investigative judgment. And so the idea behind an investigative judgment, the day of atonement equaling a time of judgment, it is thoroughly and emphatically and implicitly biblical. It is biblical. The day of atonement represents a time where either the people are cleansed or the people are cut off. It's a determining factor. Now, how many of us want to be cut off? Let me see you raise your hand. Uh, that means I'm in a group of smart people. Praise the Lord. How many want to be cleansed? Amen. Now, did you know part of the work of being cleansed, part of this work that God can accomplish in this day of atonement to cleanse us is found in Ezra chapter eight. I want you to look there. I want to just I want us to just do one small step in anti-type on one of these cooperative principles in our cooperation with God living in a time of judgment. God says, I want you to afflict your soul. So I want you to watch this. When we look at afflicting the soul, I want you to watch what inspiration says. In Ezra, we're looking at chapter 8. And I want you to see what the Bible says. If you're there, say amen. In Ezra 8 and verse 21, notice what the text says. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might do what? Afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones, and for all our substance. In the day of atonement, an application to afflicting the soul was fasting. Now that's a whole beautiful subject all by itself. But in addition to the fasting, it had a purpose. They were denying themselves physical sustenance that they might gain more spiritual sustenance. The spiritual sustenance that they were seeking to gain was that they might understand the better way for themselves, the better way for their children, and the better way even for their possessions. Everything was laid on the table. We are seeking the Lord that we might know what would he have us do. It's a time of deep heart searching. When we afflict our souls before God, we are in a time of deep heart investigation, deep heart searching. It's in that precious little book, Gospel Workers, Sister Trishiana, page 100. It says we should guard jealously our hours for prayer, the searching of the scriptures. And then the third component says, and the examination of our hearts. The next paragraph says we should do this daily. So daily, you and I should be in a habit of always examining our heart. Lord, was it was it all right how I responded to that brother? Lord, the way that I sent back that text message or that email, was, was that your spirit being represented or was it mine? Lord, those words, those actions, even these thoughts that I have, is it you? Or does another have dominion over my mind? It's a time of deep investigation. That's why we have that wonderful Psalm 139, 23 and 24 that tells us, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so we're living in a time of deep heart searching. Would you say amen to that? Amen. And brothers and sisters, we need to remember this. God already told us the condition of our heart. Did he not? Yes. God has already told us the condition of our heart. God made it very clear in Jeremiah 17, 9. He says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So our heart has a tendency to lie to us. Our minds have a tendency to tell us things that are not true. And so the same way that the truth makes us free and whom the sun sets free is free indeed. My hope and prayer is that through our investigative of our heart study today, that in the end, we will find freedom. 
I want you to turn your Bibles with me now that we have set our foundation to the book of Judges, chapter 13. In Judges 13, there's some things that I want us to notice in this story. The title of our message is again, what do you do when your gifts are flourishing, but your fruit is rotting? The Bible says in Judges chapter 13, a man was going to come on the scene. It actually names him. It's right there in Judges 13, verse 24. If you're there, please say amen. All right. The Bible says in Judges 13 and verse 24, and the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtel. Now, this, this man, Samson, there's some powerful things that we can learn from his story. And what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to focus so much on Samson. I want you to be searching your heart through the study. And I want you to be able to look at yourself and say, Lord, where am I in this story, in this picture? Now, Samson was a Nazarite. If you want to know anything about the Nazarite vow, you can read Numbers chapter 6. Verses one to about seven. If you want to know about the Nazarite vow, you can look at Numbers chapter six, pretty much verses one to seven, and you will see number one, to be a Nazarite meant you were devoted to God. Just the very term Nazarite meant that one who is devoted to God. So when Samson was brought into this world, Samson was called to be wholly devoted to God. In addition to that, they could not drink of anything that came from the vine, whether it be fresh or whether it be fermented. They also were not allowed to touch dead things. They were not supposed to do that. And then of course they could not have their hair cut because it was a symbol of their source of strength. They were not supposed to touch dead carcasses under these things. These were some of these things that were specified. Now I want you to notice that in verse 25 of Judges 13, it said the spirit of the Lord began to move him at times. So we know right from the jump when we're talking about our brother Samson, that he was a man that was led by the spirit of God. Can we say amen to that? All right. Now, what's interesting, however, is this same man who was led by the spirit of God. I want us to watch what the Bible says in chapter 14. Now we're in chapter 14 and I want you to watch what the text says. We're just going to highlight some things that's going on in Samson's life. And then what we're going to try to do is see if we can gain some lessons from it as it relates to you and to me. The Bible says in verse one, and Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of who? The Philistines. It says, and he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Was that good or was that bad? All right. We know it's bad because of verse three, right? Verse three says, then his father and his mother said unto him, is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, get her for me, for she pleases me well. Now, Samson was consecrated. Samson was filled with the spirit of God. Samson was led by the spirit of God. But now we find that Samson is at a place in his walk with the Lord. That he now sees a woman outside of his nation, a woman that represents heathenism, a woman that clearly the law made it clear. You shall not marry these in Deuteronomy chapter seven. The Bible is very clear from the point they even entered into Canaan land. Do not intermarry with those who do not believe. It was very clear. But Samson wants to go ahead and bypass the council. Now, Samson wasn't even married to the woman yet, but he's planning to get married to her, knowing that it's wrong, knowing that's a violation. You know what the Bible calls that? Iniquity. It's different. Sin is definitely violating the law of God, and sin is missing the mark and falling into that violation of the law of God. Iniquity is a bit different. Iniquity ultimately is the same principle, but iniquity is premeditated. 
It's like, I know this is wrong. I know that heaven does not approve, but I'm going to still do it anyhow because I want what I want. And so my brother, your brother, Samson, was on an iniquitous journey. And then he encouraged his parents, bless me in this iniquitous journey. Mom and dad, it's not enough that I'm violating my conscience. I want you to violate your conscience. It's bad enough that we allow ourselves to be led into sin. But it's really bad when you try to lead your family in sin with you. Well, let's see what the Bible says next. Verse four. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him. You know, boy, these things are amazing. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of, the, of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him. Now watch verse six. Keep in mind, this man has already made a decision that I want to marry this woman outside of our nation, outside of our faith. I know that God does not approve this. I don't care. I want what I want because at the end of the day, it's how she makes me feel. And even though Samson made that decision, now one day he's in Timnath and here it is that a lion comes up roaring on him. And then the Bible says something amazing in verse six. It says, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand. In spite of the fact that he has chosen to do iniquity, the spirit of God still came on him. And the spirit of God blessed him and enabled him to overcome that lion when that lion could easily have overcome him. Verse seven, and he went down and talked with the woman and she pleased Samson well. And after a time, he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. This is very interesting. And after a time, he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. Now, again, in number six, six, part of the Nazarite vow was you do not touch any dead animal. Because you would become ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. But he sees honey. Now, this brother could have found honey anyplace else. But he lives according to his senses in such a way. That the Bible says that he saw the honey inside of this dead animal. And as he sees the honey, the Bible says, and behold, verse eight, it says, and behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating. And again, it says, and he came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. This is called dishonoring your father and your mother. So again, we're looking at Samson. We're watching him from the beginning of the story. This man is anointed. He's a Nazarite. He's living by the Nazarite vow. He is truly anointed by the spirit of the living God. But here it is, as he gets to a place of maturity in his own personal decision making, he gets to a place and the first thing he wants to do is get with a pagan woman. Then he wants his parents to violate principle and to bless his union with this pagan woman. Then after that, the Bible says, even though he pursued this way, the spirit of God came on Samson when a lion came surprisingly to him and Samson was able to take him by the mouth and practically rip it apart. Only because the spirit of God enabled him to do that. And then the Bible says, but instead of instead of him being at a place where he could say, oh, thank you, Jesus, you just saved my life. Lord, what's wrong with me? I should repent. Rather than that, the Bible says that he was even more determined to go down his iniquitous path 
And now as he passes this lion with his family, or, or rather, you know, his family wasn't with him, but as he passes this lion, now he disregards his education again. And he says, you know what? Let me go ahead and stick my hand right in here, even though I know God says I shouldn't. And let me go ahead and get some honey. And then, of all things, after he's enjoying it, he goes to mom and dad. Mom and dad, why don't you have some yourself? They trust their beloved son, so they go ahead and take some too. Then Samson presents a riddle to some of the brothers from the Philistines. You read that in verse 12. It says, and Samson said unto them, I will now put forth a riddle unto you. If you can certainly declare it me within seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. But if you cannot declare it me, then shall ye give me 30 sheets and 30 change of garments. And they said unto him, put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. And he said unto them, out of the eater came forth meat. And out of the strong came forth sweetness, and they could not in three days expound the riddle. So they had a period of time. Here it is that the Bible says that the days expanded. It was almost spent completely. They reached the seventh day. But because that woman was from their nation, they know how she is. So they were able to coerce her to go ahead and go to Samson to find out the riddle. So then the riddles go ahead and it's told and Samson is livid about it to the point that the Bible says in verse 19, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Here goes the spirit of God coming again. The spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. Samson got so mad because of the fact that he knew that they talked with his wife to find out the riddle. That in his anger, he decides to go ahead and do something. And he wants to go ahead and hurt these people. And the Bible says the spirit of the Lord came on him. It almost makes some of us begin to question some things. Lord, why are you blessing abundantly somebody that keeps going down the path of iniquity? You see, the Bible teaches that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And God's grace was all over Samson. And this should be something for us who are so-called believers in present truth. We're always quick to condemn people. We're always quick to talk about who's on their way to hell and who's cast off and who's God's people versus who aren't. We're always quick to go ahead and put people out of the will of God, out of harmony with God because of the fact that right now they might be doing something that is sinful. But here it is that the Bible is showing that this is a man anointed by God, a Nazarite, many gifts, brought up in a Christian home, brought up in present truth. And this brother is making all sorts of vile, terrible decisions. And still, God not only is merciful, but God literally is pouring his spirit upon him and empowering him. Yeah. But his story's not over yet. We are now in chapter 15. <laughs> the Bible says that when Samson killed those people, Samson's wife got with his companion, his buddy. And, uh, you know, Samson eventually was like, look, that's my wife. I'm coming back for her. And the father was like, well, I thought you moved on. So I go ahead and have my daughter marry, you know, your friend, your buddy. And. Samson was very, very bothered about this to the point that it says in verse three, and Samson said concerning them, now shall I be more blameless because they ended up, they ended up actually killing. You'll see this in just a moment. They actually ended up killing Samson's wife as well as the wife's father. But the Bible says in verse four, and Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands. Did you know that it takes the power of God to catch 300 foxes? You know, we talk about country living so much. You ever tried catching a fox? In other words, this brother, that it took God to enable him to even do that. How in the world could you catch not one? I'd have been impressed with what if, if somebody said, hey, look at this. And they show me a fox. I'm like, bro, how'd you get that? They was like, man, I chased him down. I'd have been like, you good. But what about 300? 
And so the Bible says, and Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into standing in the corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn with vineyards and olives. Power from God. He's not using it in the right way. After they did this, they, they were so upset that they came to the Israelites because, you know, they were the leader over the nation. And they come to the Israelites like, look, you need to deliver Samson to us. And the, his brethren come to him like, listen, all right, you know, Samson, we need your cooperation because these people are getting on our nerves. They're, they're threatening us and so on. We need to turn you into the Philistines. And Samson says, listen, you can turn me into the Philistines. Just promise me that you won't turn on me and try to kill me. Now. Could they have killed Samson? I don't think so. In other words, what Samson was really saying is, don't try to kill me because if you try to kill me, I'm going to have to kill you. You understand that? When you read Patriarchs and Prophets story on this, it literally breaks down that that was Samson's attitude. It wasn't so much that he was scared that they were going to kill him. But if y'all try to kill me, I'm going to have to kill you. And I don't want to kill you. So please don't try to kill me. You understand that? That was more the angle of where he's coming from, because Samson knew where his message last night strength. He knew his strength. He knew where it came from. Now. After they turned him in to the Philistines, what does it say in verse 14 of, of Judges 15, verse 14 in Judges 15? It says, and when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire and his bands loose from off his hands. And he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. You know, I don't know if you're if you're understanding this, but what we're reading about these things that Samson is doing is miraculous. You can't kill a thousand people with an animal's jawbone. Follow that? Can't do that. In other words, Brother Samson, his gifts are flourishing because he's just still strong and he's able to do more and more miraculous things. It was gifts from the Spirit of God because when you read 1 Corinthians 12, one of the gifts of the Spirit is the working of miracles. Samson was able to do these miraculous things. He was gifted by God with the super strength and it seems evident that his gift was flourishing. But the more that you look at Samson, the fruit of his life was rotting. The fruit of his life was rotting. And one of the blind spots of Samson, and I wonder, could it be a blind spot for us as God's people? One of the blind spots for Samson is that because he kept seeing his gift flourishing, he did not give as much attention to his fruit that was rotting. Have you ever met somebody that you try to correct and say, brother, or sister, looks like you're going in the wrong direction. Why don't you change your direction? And they say, well, why should I? My gifts are flourishing. The ministry is growing. The people are being blessed. Income is coming in. Our debts are being paid. Souls are being saved. We ignore the clear deterioration and oxidation of what's happening in our families and in our spiritual life. We ignore it. And it's like God in mercy is literally saying, are you seeing it? Your gifts are flourishing, yes, but are you seeing the fruit and how it's rotting? It's like Samson could not catch this picture. And part of his blindness was the fact that the gifts were still so flourishing. Let's continue. The Bible says in Judges 15, <laughs> Right down to verse 19, it says, but God clave and holy place that was in the law and there came water there out. Because Samson, you know, he was thirsty. He wanted to get some refreshment. 
And it says, and when he had drunk, his spirit came again and he revived. I mean, I just want you to see this. It's like Samson is going down a vicious path of iniquity. Samson is making horrible sins. Samson, brothers and sisters, is getting worse. You see, the first time, the first time, I know Samson's getting worse. And I know that his fruit was rotting. You know why? Because at first, the Bible said in Judges 14 that at least the man wanted to marry the woman from Timnath. At least he still felt like, well, I should at least marry her. Yes, she was outside of the faith. Yes, she's outside of the nation. No, it's not the will of God. But you can see that morals was still somewhere in Samson's life. Rather than just getting with her, he said, mom and dad, marry me to her. I want to be married. But oh, watch how watch the degrading impact of sin. Because now we're in Judges 16. And in Judges 16 and verse one, it says, then went Samson to Gaza and saw there what? An harlot and went in unto her. Now, before he saw this fine woman or whatever term you want to use, and he's like, man, she, she, she pleases me. Boy, I got to get with her. But at least marriage was in the picture. But now he's degraded so much. He's not paying attention to the fact your gifts are flourishing, but your fruit is rotting, brother. He's not seeing the rotting of the fruit of his character. He's not paying attention to it. And so here goes Samson now. And now Samson's at a place where Samson is like, you know what? Now that I see this sister, she just looks good. And I'm just going to get with her. And I don't even want to talk about marriage. So the Bible says, then went Samson to Gaza and saw there and heard it and went in unto her. And it was told the Gezites saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night saying in the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. Verse three. And when and Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them and bar and all and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. How did Samson do that? God once again showed up, touched his son Samson and Samson got some strain and Samson once again did a miracle, ripped the door off with the post remaining and carried it out like nobody is going to lock me in. After he finished knocking up this woman, here it is. God still blessed him. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And now here it is, brother Samson walks out of there. And again, rather than saying God has been so merciful, let me change my ways. Verse four says of Judges 16, and it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. You know, I used to say to some friends of mine, never confuse God's mercy for God's will. I have, I have to say that a lot to ministers. I have to say that to ministries. Don't confuse God's mercy with God's will. Sometimes the reason that our ministries are still going, sometimes the reason our lives are still going is because God is merciful to us. But some of the ways that we're living and some of the ways that we're operating and some of the ways that we're functioning is not the will of God. But we confuse like Samson. We say, well, since the gifts are flourishing, I'm not paying attention to that fruit that's rotting. And as a result of that, I am emboldened to keep going in this same path. I see it all the time. You know, one of the greatest violations that we have in ministry is how we man manage money. Pacific Union Recorder, December 19, 1901. Chapter is called Bookkeeping. Read it. P-U-R, Pacific Union Recorder, December 19, 1901. The chapter is entitled Bookkeeping. I challenge you 
for all of us who have, there's a lot of ministries under this roof. If we were to read Pacific Union Recorder, December 19, 1901, if we were to read what that thing says on God's principles of bookkeeping, we would begin to see that some of us are not managing God's money the way that he told us to. And some of us are not listening to the council because like Samson, we're saying, but our gifts are flourishing. And we're not paying attention to the fruit factors that no, your fruit is actually rotting. Things are getting worse and worse and worse. And like Samson, sooner or later, you plateau. The Bible continues in Judges 16. And it says a very sad statement in verse 19. And she made him sleep upon her knees and she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him and his strength went from him. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. There comes a point that if we just don't see what God was really trying to do, God allows us to get to a place where he can actually for a time remove his protective hand or remove his presence. And the Bible says that the Lord departed from him and now he's a slave. He has been degraded. He has been handled profusely in ugly and ungodly ways. Eyes plucked out, profaned before the heathen. But the Bible says something very nice in verse 22. It says, how be it? The hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Samson finally reached a place of repentance. Finally got the message. Finally got the message. And in that place of repentance, verse 28 says, and Samson called unto the Lord and said, oh, Lord, God, remember me, I pray thee. And strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And verse 30 says, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Like Josiah. Samson could have had a different ending. God's plan for Samson was not that he goes out like this. That was not God's plan. God's plan was that he was going to use, use Samson against those Philistines. He was going to use them, use him. He was going to use them to take down that nation, but this was not the method. But even when God sets a plan, he will not force you and he will not force me to follow his plan. He will plead. He will woo, he will call, he will do all sorts of things to get our attention. But if we just won't listen, then a time can come where God says, I will now let you reap the results of your decision. Did you know Josiah was supposed to die a peaceful death? That's what the Bible says. That, that was God's promise to Josiah. He said, you're going you're gonna to go to your grave in peace. That's what God promised him. But when that war came and when the messenger from the east was coming and Josiah was standing up, the brother said, listen, get out of the way. God has sent me. Josiah did not listen. He ignored the voice of God. And the Bible shows that Josiah died a very, very violent death when he was supposed to go to his grave in absolute peace. God sets plans for every single one of us. In that precious little book, Education, page 267, under the chapter, The Life Work, it says very, very clearly, the specific place appointed us in this life will be determined by our capabilities. Did you know God has a specific place for you? 
That's totally opposite of abstract. God says, I have a specific place. March 22, 1972, when I came into this world, God says, I have a specific place for my little son, Dwayne Levin. And the same goes for every single one of you. God has a plan. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for our ministries. He has a plan for everything. But what happens often is sometimes we begin to consult our gifts more than the fruit condition of our hearts. Listen, family, I don't have the ability to read your motives. And quite honestly, I don't want the ability. It more than likely would depress me. I think God in mercy prohibits us from reading other people's motives. But family, I'm telling you the truth. For a lot of us, if you search your heart carefully, how are you doing today? Are you more patient or are you less patient? I don't care how much money your ministry is getting. I don't care how much you're traveling. I don't care how much you are just growing and all sorts of people, heathens and the rest are coming to Christ. Thanks a lot. Glad to hear it. You can preach to others, but you yourself be a castaway. I care about you. I'm caring about you. I'm asking you, how are you doing? Are you more patient? Are you more gentle now than maybe five years ago when you first came to the faith? I want you to pay attention to your fruit because what God is doing is Satan was on a leash and he was allowed to go thus far and no further in many of our lives. But I know for me, and I believe I'm not the only one, somehow God has extended his leash and he has allowed the devil to attack me and my family more than we've ever been attacked before. And God says, Dwayne, don't worry about it because count it as a reward because I see something in you and I see something in your children and I see something in your family that if you all cooperate with me, I will show you how you can win even at this stage in the fight. But what that also tells me is that God is gonna allow that leash to be lengthened the devil's still on the leash because if the devil was unleashed, we'd all be dead. Amen. His mission is very simple. Steal, kill, destroy, because he knows when we're dead, there's no repentance in the grave. So even when Satan attacks you and I, he's still on a leash. God is still saying thus far, no further. God is still measuring. Satan throws the blow. God says, hold up. God says, let's weigh this. Let's measure this. All right. Dwayne. He can handle this. Continue. And then when the blow comes, God says, now, Dwayne, that blow that just came to you, don't look at it as coming from Satan. Look at it coming from me. You read this in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 71. The blow that was aimed at Christ, the blow came from the Father. And then it says, and the presence of Christ encircles us. And every blow that Satan throws at us is first measured and weighed by Christ. Therefore, when the blow comes, she says we are to receive it as if it is coming from Christ. Amen. What God is trying to say. Is could it be that living in this time of judgment that we are living under a deception of thinking that we're in a better place than perhaps we really are because we're paying more attention to our gifts that are flourishing while we are ignoring the fruit of our lives that are rotting. You know, you know what the Bible calls children? The fruit of the womb. I stand before you as a man in ministry. It is possible to spend a lot of time ministering to others and watching the gift. You know, I had people for years tell me to slow down. I had people for years that told me to slow down. Dwayne, you got to slow down, man. You're going too much. You're going too much. You're pushing too hard, Dwayne. You're going too fast, son. And I would just be like, I got to keep going. And you know what I would do? I would say, look at the gifts. They're flourishing. More skill, more talent, more ability. 
more influence, more outreach, more souls being saved and baptized. And God was saying, but son, look at the fruit of your womb. They're starting to rot. Today, I am fighting for the salvation of my children. It's almost like a lot of what I, I, I probably could have done better when they were younger. Now I got to do it when they're all in their 20s. The fight of my life. Because I can't sit back and watch my people get lost. And God is like, son. You were focusing on your gifts that were flourishing. I cannot tell you how many times I kept saying, but look at all the souls being saved. Look at all the people turning from the world to Christ. And I focus so much on that, that God says, you got fruit of the womb right here. That's rotting in front of your eyes. And so the Lord brought me back to my first works. You see, Jesus said in John 15, let's use this as our closing point here. John 15, and I, and I know Brother Jackson, he's already been talking about this, but he's going to talk about it more. I know him. So I'm very excited and I'm very thankful for the way God's spirit is leading. In John 15, here's what Christ says. In John 15 and verse five, some of you are probably at a place that you know your fruit is rotting. You know it. You know that when it comes down to the character qualities of Christ, you're losing it. And I get it. In this, in, in this environment here, we all put on the happy Sabbath face. I get it. You know, we become the fake of the fake. You know, it's like we all say, hey, happy Sabbath, brother. And we'll have problems with the same person we're shaking hands with. And you know that God gave you a ministry of reconciliation, but you refuse to reconcile. Right? It's like we know what's up. This is a great place for acting. That's why all the lights are on. It's like God knows there's a lot of actors and actresses under this tent. God knows. And in our little mission reports, and I'm not here to put down the mission reports. Listen, I'm, I'm a supporter and will continue to be a supporter of every single mission. I have an indelible love for the several ministries that are represented here and the chief ministry that's running this event. It's not an issue for me. But brothers and sisters, sometimes we allow the testimony of what our ministries and such and such are doing. And it can cause us, if we're not careful, pay attention to the fruit. What's the fruit looking like? Are your kids getting more worldly now that you're empowering them in ministry and they're getting their hands on more electronics? Are you watching the fruit? Are you watching it carefully? Is that fruit going through some oxidation? God says, pay attention to that. Now watch this. Jesus says in John 15, it's actually the answer. Lord, what do I do? Remember, that was the question of our message. What do you do when your gifts are flourishing, but your fruit is rotting? Like, what do you do? Well, the Bible says it very simply in John 15, 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth what? Much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. So there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between us and Christ and our ability to know what it is in the most practical sense to abide in him. And as a result of that, our fruit is rotting. But our gifts might still be flourishing. And so I'm reading from that I may know him. Page. 132. And I want you to listen to these words. Abide in me are words of great significance. Abiding in Christ means a living, earnest, refreshing faith that works by love and purifies the soul. It means a constant receiving of the spirit of Christ, constant receiving of the spirit of Christ, a life of unreserved surrender to his service. What are you holding back? Where is it that you're not trusting him? For some of us, it's money. For some of us, it's our children. For some of us, it's our spouses. Some of us will put our husbands and wives before God. Some of you who got these ministries, if you got to check your husband, ladies, you better check him. If you love your man 
and you see clear as day that what he is doing or how he's deciding is going against the principles of the word of God. You got to love your husband enough. I'm not saying that you do it in, on a pulpit in front of a whole bunch of people. But what I'm saying is you got to learn how to lovingly pull your husband aside. And you got to be like, honey, here's what God is saying. And I'm seeing us going in a different direction. We can't do this. You got to love your man and you got to love your woman enough to be able to say, if I got to even check you, I will do it. I will do it in love. But I will do it. Amen. It says where this union exists, God, good works will appear. The life of the vine will manifest itself in fragrant fruit on the branches. The continual supply of the grace of Christ will bless you and make you a blessing till you can say with Paul, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives within me. God says, listen, the more that we focus on the principles of abiding in Christ. Now, I've seen dad, as I call him, but brother Jackson, you know, I, I've seen him expound so much on abiding because he gets it and he's still an imperfect man, isn't he? And so it is that he gets it. I'm not, I'm not trying to hear that to elevate him beyond measure. I'm just saying he got the message. And like all of us, sometimes you can get the message and then you can struggle at certain points with the message that you got. All right. And that's why we need prayer, not constant praise. But I know that he presses these points, but beloved, I want you to leave this tent, leave this camp meeting with a deep searching of the heart as we're called to do in this wonderful anti-typical day of atonement that we afflict our souls and say, Lord, where am I with you? How do I really feel about people? And I'm not talking about the people who treat you nice. I'm talking about the treat people who treat you flat out dirty and nasty. That's your test. Your test is not your boys and your people who just come to you and are like, hey, everything's great and so on. I'm talking about the people who are against you. In every way. Where's your heart with these people? I'm not talking about right words. Well, you know, we got to pray for that, brother. Where in your heart, you're like, I, I can't wait till he disappears. If he disappears and I never see him again, it'll be too soon. Sometimes, Christ Object Lessons 159, the lips may express something that the heart does not agree with. So it's possible to say all the right things but our hearts are still in the wrong condition. My beloved friends, my beloved brothers and sisters, what do you do when your gifts are flourishing, but your fruit is rotting? The answer is go back to your first works and learn once again what it is to abide in Christ. That's how we literally will start bearing much fruit. That is ripe for the taking. Question. How many of us understood our study this morning? Did we understand the study? Did you hear what God said to you this morning? Did we just see Samson? I hope we saw us. If you know that you're in a place that you probably fell into that trap. Lord, I got caught up in my gifts that were flourishing. It's going to take courage to stand because I'm, I'm appealing to every minister, pastor, uh, everybody, all the, the heads of whatever ministries and departments. This, this, this takes some humility to do this because I, I, there's no way under the sun God gave me this message just so only the lights say amen. I know that God gave this message because there's some of us in this room that's battling with this right now. I fell into this trap, beloved. I fell into this trap. I'm telling you, it's a very deceptive trap. If there's anybody in this room that could say, you know what? I fell into the trap of paying so much attention to my gifts that were flourishing that I neglected to see more faithfully and carefully my fruit that is rotting. I invite you to stand to your feet. I want to pray for you. If that's you, I just want to pray for you. So I want to pray for you because we're living in a very serious time. We're preparing for eternity. And God wants to bring about a dynamic change in our hearts. And I want you to know that as you stand, Christ stands with you. That's the best part about the story of the gospel, isn't it? Amen. Paganism teaches about the heathen who chases after the holy God. Christianity is the only religion on earth that talks about the holy God chasing after the sinner. Yes. 
What a story. Yes. And that's your savior. Amen. That's my savior. That's my friend, Jesus. Amen. And so Jesus is saying, listen, I'm coming after you. I'm not going to let you go. Amen. Jesus says, I don't want I, I put Samson's story in here, not for it to be repeated, but that we might learn from it. Yes. And I believe we learn from it tonight or today. And by God's grace, don't lose what you gain today. Amen. Yes. Let's pray together. Loving father, we thank you so much for everything that you've taught us, Lord. We thank you that you are giving us a better view, a clearer view of how we can remain on this very narrow road that leads ultimately into eternity. I pray in the name of Jesus, help us, Lord, not to pay so much attention to our gifts that are flourishing, but help us, Father, to look more carefully at our fruit that is rotting. And by your grace, Lord, may you pour upon each of us that refreshing, that will help our fruit to grow in abundance, some 30, some 60, and some even 100 fold. Bless us to this end, I pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Faithfulness, thy faithfulness.